So um, uh, let's start this morning's session. Our first speaker is uh, Yair Shokef. He's going to talk to us about confinement effects on jamming transition in kinetically constrained models. Okay, so thank you. Um, so first, thanks uh, Tal and Tal for uh, uh, and Tal for giving me the opportunity to. Uh, uh, to tell you a bit about my work. Uh, hopefully by uh, 9.30 you'll know a bit about uh, what are kinetically constrained models and what are we using them for. Uh, and in particular, how does confinement uh, affect jamming? So before all these complicated words, maybe a few words about uh, uh, the jamming transition or, or how all kinds of systems become uh, jammed. Uh, and the main idea behind this uh, uh, line of research is to try and understand uh, whether we can connect between the mechanical uh, properties of all kinds of soft matter systems, in a minute I'll, I'll give some examples, uh, whether we can uh, uh, use any knowledge or understanding of such systems in order to understand uh, glasses. Um, so w when I say soft matter systems, usually what I have in mind is all kinds of systems comprised of uh, macroscopic uh, building blocks like uh, uh, these granular systems uh, comprised of very, very large uh, uh, solid uh, rocks, uh, colloidal suspensions, foams, emulsions, uh, you name it. Um, and I want to try and, and, and convince you that there are many connections between uh, such systems which we, we know and, and see on very macroscopic length scale uh, to uh, glasses which you all know uh, very well from your er er everyday life and also you may also know a bit about uh, the chemical structure um, of glasses. And the, the, the main connection between these two uh, uh, types of systems is that the, the, the um, arrangement of the particles comprising these systems is uh, disordered, like in a fluid, uh, whereas the uh, dynamics or uh, mechanical rigidity of these systems is like of a, a solid. So we'll refer to all kinds of systems that are, on one hand, fluid-like in their structure and solid-like in their uh, 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 mechanics or dynamics as jammed uh, systems. So you can ask whether there's some analogy between, uh, 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 say, granular matter, but you know you can think of a, a, a much broader class of systems, and I'll show you some examples in the next slide, and uh, molecular uh, glasses. Uh, however, there is a big difference between these two classes of systems, and that is the way in which such systems become unjammed. Okay, so typically when you have a material which is in a, a condensed or, or, or solid uh, phase, as you heat it, it uh, melts and it becomes a, a, a fluid. So glasses are unjammed by thermal heated, heating. That is, when you raise the temperature, uh, uh, this glass becomes uh, a fluid. Similarly, this pile of, of rocks can become unjammed, it can flow, uh, if you apply some mechanical driving, okay, so if you somehow push it uh, 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 mechanically with forces which are much, much larger than uh, 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 thermal forces, you can cause it to uh, flow. And then the second question you can ask is whether uh, shaking is analogous in any way uh, to heating. Uh, so now I'll try to focus ourselves more to the topic uh, uh, of my talk today, and that is how does confinement affect this jamming transition. So there are all kinds of, of, uh, of, of examples of such uh, amorphous uh, systems in confined geometries. Uh, one of them is uh, these experiments by, uh, uh, um, uh, from Doug Durian's lab at Penn uh, of a, a, a colloidal suspension uh, flowing through a rather narrow uh, uh, channel. Uh, there are similar uh, or related experiments by my Spanish uh, colleague uh, Iker Zuriguel uh, um, of soft particles trying to flow through a narrow 
uh, opening. Um, similar uh, um, situations occur uh, in what's called the pneumatic conveying uh, systems, which is something very common in industry. This is supposed to be a video which is not playing. Um, Okay, so there's a nice video that if you'll search this Zeppelin on uh, YouTube, you'll probably find many similar mov movies trying to uh, 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 transport uh, powders through pipes uh, using some uh, uh, gas pressure. And there are all kinds of interesting questions there of how uh, uh, these grains uh, can uh, become jammed or can jam the, the, uh, the pipe and obviously all of these uh, people are investing lots of money in trying to uh, uh, um, uh, uh, prevent this uh, jamming. Um, um, so now the same uh, lab in, 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 in Pamplona um, performed these uh, rather uh, cleaner laboratory experiments uh, in which they just recycled laser pointer is not working, uh, they recycled uh, uh, grains that went up that green pipe and then down uh, this uh, uh, narrower uh, pipe. And you can clearly see here um, how, even though there's gravity here trying to pull these uh, rocks downwards, uh, they're uh, stuck due to some arch which is uh, uh, spanning the entire width of this, oh, it's fine, uh, of this uh, tube. Uh, similar things can be seen also in slightly smaller scales, uh, still thousands of uh, nanometers, uh, but still gradually getting to, to the nanoscale. Uh, again, from Penn, Arjun Yod's lab, uh, uh, these are uh, diameter tunable colloidal uh, 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 spheres inside narrow uh, pipes, and you can see all these interesting structures. Uh, which have many similarities to carbon nanotubes. But that's a topic for another talk. Um, so this is a few words about uh, uh, confinement in this context of, uh, of jamming. And I tried to connect all this to uh, the title of this uh, 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 workshop. And obviously, there's also similar work in uh, glass-forming systems, namely all kinds of uh, fluids or, or, or polymer, polymer uh, 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 melts that uh, uh, undergo a, a glass transition, namely as you cool uh, these systems, they transform from fluid to uh, uh, a glass. And then what people typically measure is what is that typical temperature at which you observe this transition, namely the glass transition uh, temperature. And it turns out that there things are much more complicated because there are several competing uh, uh, effects. One of them tends to uh, raise the glass transition temperature uh, due to uh, confinement. The other one tends to lower the glass transition temperature due to uh, confinement. That, uh, uh, again, I, I won't get uh, too much into this uh, today. What I do want to tell you about is how we're trying to theoretically describe all of these uh, phenomena of how does confinement uh, influence the jamming transition or the glass transition. And, what, and, and our approach is using what's called kinetically constrained models. So uh, before presenting these uh, rather simple models, uh, I'll say a few words about the physical origin for slow and cooperative dynamics in all kinds of systems like the one I've, I've just reviewed. Uh, and you can think of all these systems as comprised of some amorphous uh, structure made of, of, of particles. And, you know, let's think of these particles just as orange balls. Uh, and now the reason that this, uh, uh, these amorphous packings are stuck is that if you look, for instance, at this uh, orange particle, which I just uh, uh, painted blue, it, in principle, it could also be here. But dynamically, it's very hard for this particle to move here because these two particles are blocking it. But now the problem is even more complicated, or this particle is even more stuck or frustrated because these particles are by themselves blocked by, by their, their neighbors. So in order for the system to uh, rearrange, you need to wait for these particles to move. And therefore, you get something which is very, very slow or sometimes even uh, uh, entirely stuck uh, due to a cooperative uh, effect. And this is what gives rise to this phase transition. Uh, the way we uh, 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 describe this uh, uh, physical mechanism is by very simple uh, lattice models, 
uh, called kinetically constrained models. And uh, you know, one example in which uh, you can demonstrate this is imagine these particles can't be in anywhere they want, but they, they're restricted to live on some uh, 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 spatial uh, lattice. And now our kinetic constraint is going to be introduced by the fact that we're going to allow a particle to move to a neighboring lattice site, for instance, here this is in the two-dimensional triangle lattice, only if some kinetic constraint uh, is satisfied. In, in particular, in order to make the connection to this cartoon I showed you uh, above, I'm going to uh, prohibit this move, for instance, because the gap here is too small for this particle to go through. Again, you know, in this specific model, they also uh, so uh, uh, prohibited these two rules, so, uh, these two moves, and only this particle can move to the right only if these two adjacent sites are vacant. Okay, so this is one example of a kinetically constrained uh, model. And then one big qu question here is whether such kinetically constrained models can undergo such a jamming uh, phase transition at a non-trivial density. Okay, so obviously the a, a particle density here is some number between zero and one, what fraction of the lattice sites are occupied, and you want to see whether there's some interesting uh, transition at some non-trivial uh, density. And uh, not that long ago, uh, initiated by a, a, a mathematical work by Alex Hol Holroyd, which was then translated to uh, a more physical language uh, by uh, Toninelli, Biroli, and Fisher, um, um, you can show that all, at least all the models that were considered at that time uh, do not undergo such a jamming transition. Okay? And then I'll, I'll try to explain uh, why we are still uh, working on this. And the idea behind uh, 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 this proof is that, you know, based on what I showed in the previous, previous slide, particles are blocked because their neighbors are blocked, and their neighbors are blocked because their neighbors are, are blocked, and so on. Therefore, these blocked particles can form clusters uh, of mutually blocked particles, and then in order for a particle to move, it needs some particle at the edge of that cluster to uh, move. And then you can try and consider uh, 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 the typical size try and, and, and identify the typical size of these uh, clusters, which obviously is a function of density, and then the system would be jammed if this typical length scale is larger than the system size. So for all the kinetically constrained models, at least those considered at uh, uh, that time, um, this typical length scale is finite for any finite density, and therefore uh, if your system is large enough, this, it will never get... Uh, jam, no matter how large the dens density is. However, uh, subsequently, the same people uh, uh, realized that you can uh, uh, define slightly more complicated kinetically constrained models, and maybe I'll give a, 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 you some flavor of that uh, if I'll have any time left. Um, you can define slightly more complicated kinetic rules uh, for which this typical length scale diverges at the finite density, and then you will have a true phase transition between uh, a fluid-like phase and a, a, a stuck or glass-like uh, phase above this critical uh, density. Uh, the second way in which you can get uh, jamming at some non-trivial density is if you uh, consider um, confined systems. Namely, if you consider systems which are confined, like all these examples I showed you before of uh, um, you know, some molecular fluid inside nanopores or grains f trying to flow through a, uh, a tube in a pneumatic, pneumatic conveying uh, system, then you would have interesting uh, uh, jamming uh, uh, effects or a jamming transition uh, even at a non-trivial uh, density. Okay, so what I'm going to tell you in the time I have left is uh, joint work with my very talented PhD student, Eyal Teomi, and if I'll have even more time left, which I doubt it, I'll also tell you a few words about our uh, uh, activity on these slightly more complicated kinetically constrained models in which we've identified the true phase transition even in the thermodynamic limit. Uh, and this is joint work with Andrea Liu from Penn and uh, here at Tel Aviv uh, uh, with this, that same Eyal Teomi and with uh, Ontina Ghosh, a postdoc in my group. Um, so I'll focus on one of the simplest kinetically constrained model, na models, namely the Cobb-Anderson model, and this is uh, just defined on a two-dimensional square lattice, and each particle can move if it has at least a certain number here, two uh, neighboring vacancies, 
uh, uh, around it. Uh, and it's, well, what one can show, I won't say it's that easy, but one, one, one can show that um, if you start for, from a random site uh, uh, in this lattice, um, you can ask yourself, what is the probability that you can start from that site and from it uh, cause a rearrangement event that would unfreeze the entire system? Okay, so namely that you can seed a critical droplet from that uh, site, and it turns out that uh, at least Alex Holroyd could calculate uh, this probability, and it goes like the exponent of minus two times some constant, which you can calculate exactly, divided by the vacancy density, namely one minus the particle density uh, on the lattice. And therefore, if you want to ask whether your system is jammed or not, you only need to ask the following question. Is there at least one such site in my system that can unfreeze the entire system? Namely, if you have, say, a box of size L, L by L, then you'll calculate the average number of such critical droplets. Namely, we'll multiply the number of sites in the system times the probability that each site can seed such a rearrange rearrangement event. When that is of the order of unity, that would be the threshold for the system being jammed or uh, and unjammed. Okay? And from this, you can easily get that the critical vacancy density, uh, which is 1 minus the critical particle density, just scales like 1 over the log of the uh, system size. Of course, yes, 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 yes. I'll, I'll show you, yes, this is in two dimensions, in a moment I'll, I'll show you results for arbitrary dimension, yes, that, that's a very important point. Um, so what uh, we've done, this is again together with the Yalte Omi at my group in Tel Aviv, uh, considered uh, very, very long uh, tunnels of a finite uh, width with the same uh, model. So naively you can say, oh, from a single side, there's that probability to see the critical droplet, and let's let, now multiply that by the entire size of the system, which would be W times L instead of L times L we had before. But we've identified that in this model, if you have at least two consecutive columns that are completely full, then by the rules of this model, all the particles in this wall will never move. Okay? And this is very similar to, to, to these arches I showed you in that uh, experiment with the uh, rock inside uh, uh, that plastic uh, tube. You can have arches uh, that uh, bridge between the two sides of your uh, container, and these arches can sustain uh, an uh, infinite uh, load on them. Uh, therefore, the system is divided into disconnected uh, regions. Now, if you want to ask whether the system is jammed or not, you need to ask whether in each such unfrozen section, you have at least one uh, critical droplet. Okay? Namely, we'll calculate the average number of such critical droplets instead of calculating it in the entire L by L system. I calculate it in this typical uh, uh, section, which has width W and length, small L, which is the average distance between these two walls. Okay? And in this model, it's very, very easy to calculate uh, to get an, an analytic expression for this uh, uh, typical distance between two uh, walls, and we've managed to do that, and you plug that into that very, very simple equation saying that the, uh, the, the threshold for being jammed is when you have of the order of one such critical droplet in each uh, section, and from this, again, with very simple alg algebra, you find that the critical vacancy density scales instead as one over log of the system size, it scales like one over the square root of the system uh, width, um, Even if you have an atomized zone between the walls, it's not Yes. Yeah. Um, okay, so these are analytic results which perfectly match numerical simulations. This is for square systems. These are for these elongated tunnels. So you see that this is the this uh, uh, result I showed you before, but you know, then I flashed also this slightly more lengthy expression which we managed to obtain, which you see that uh, 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 fits the numerical data uh, perfectly. Um, so I don't think I have enough time to get into this story of looking at huge systems. Um, I, I, I do want to say a few words about higher dimensions of what I've showed you so far again, mainly for presentation purposes in two dimensions, we managed to analyze these models in arbitrary dimension, and there it turns out that the, the, the uh, uh, cardinal thing to look at 
is whether this uh, number m in the rules of the model, telling you how many vacant neighbors you need in order to be unjammed, is smaller than or larger than the spatial dimension. Okay, so what I showed you before is uh, m equal to and, do, and d equal to, and we got uh, this case, which, you know, if you'll plug here d equal to and m equal to, you'll get these 1 over log l I showed you uh, before, but there are general results for uh, uh, arbitrary dimension, arbitrary value of this in number m. Okay, so these are things that other people uh, did before we entered uh, this game. What we did is looked at confinement in high dimensions. Namely, we're now looking, instead of a, 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 a compact a, a hypercube, which is a, you know, a square or a cube, or you know, there are results for arbitrary dimensions, um, we're looking at hyperrhomboids. Maybe we're going to look at arbitrary objects which have arbitrary ratios between uh, the, the, the side, the lengths of the, in the different directions. And what we've identified is that the relevant thing to look at is to identify the effective dimensionality of this uh, object, namely what I showed you before was a two-dimensional system which was effectively one-dimensional. Okay, if I took a finite width and looked at, 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 looked at very, very long uh, uh, tunnels. Okay, so we have these, so that would be an effectively one-dimensional system and therefore its jamming behavior is uh, uh, different uh, than a two-dimensional system and we have these general results. I'll just demonstrate this in what probably interests most people here, which is three dimensions. Uh, in three dimensions, you can use these results in order to demonstrate what's called jamming by shape. Namely, you can take, uh, uh, take a box with a fixed volume and a fixed number of particles in it, namely fixed density, and change only the aspect ratio. Namely, you can take this uh, uh, cube and, uh, you know, one direction would be uh, uh, squishing it in this direction and, and, and getting this quasi one uh, two dimensional system, or you can stretch it in one direct in one direction and compress it in the other two and get this quasi one dimensional system and then for as a function of this aspect ratio uh, 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 of the uh, this uh, shape, we can calculate the how jammed is the system, namely what is the uh, fraction of particles which uh, will never be able to move. And we found this interesting result that uh, you can demonstrate this non-monotonic uh, jamming by shape, namely, uh, uh, if you, you know, compress it in this direction or in that direction, it causes the, the system to be jammed, whereas only when the system is more compact and has an, a higher effective dimension, uh, it's unjammed. Um, so to summarize the first part of my talk, um, what I want you to remember from, from what I've told you so far is that uh, kinetically constrained models, these very simple lattice models in which we move particles from one site to a neighboring site uh, only if some local kinetic constraint is satisfied, these models can be useful for describing uh, jamming. What I told you so far is uh, uh, how does confinement affect uh, this jamming and the, the Two important things to remember is one is that when you have confinement, this can cause the system to be divided into independent sections. And the second is that uh, confinement obviously can change the effective uh, dimensionality and that can cause uh, 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 jamming to be qualitatively different. And, you know, the uh, again, cleanest manifestation of this is the transition from the logarithmic scaling to the algebraic scaling of the critical density with system size. So. Do I have? I don't have any time left. So in the time I don't have left, I wanted to tell you about uh, this uh, current work of us on uh, uh, what's called jamming percolation. Namely, we're looking at kinetically constrained models which are slightly more complicated than this Cobb-Anderson model, but still with local kinetic rules for which we managed to prove that even in the thermodynamic limit, when, namely when your system size is infinite, uh, you have a true phase transition between a fluid-like phase and a glass-like or a phase or a jammed phase um, at the critical density of directed percolation, uh, and we have all kinds of analytical uh, and numerical results uh, uh, for this. And whoever is interested, I can tell you about that uh, in private. So thank you. Questions. How would size distribution of particles, like binary mixtures or, or continuous size distribution, 
affect those results? Um, about the, no, no, I, 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 I see. So, again, we, we we don't have any results about that, and we we didn't consider it uh, that much. What we, uh, you know, we, we we did think about is models in which you can complicate things by saying that you have you know a mixture of different types of particles, and and, and each particle, instead of being of different size, has different you know a different tendency to be jammed, namely a different value of that parameter m in my model telling whether uh, how many neighbors you need in order to to move. Okay, so this is, again, a very simple way, in, uh, simple for, for us mathematically to implement some uh, polydispersity uh, in the system. Uh, so that is something that we can describe, and again, there isn't a dramatic uh, effect. In order to incorporate true polydispersity, again, because our Spatial structure is discrete. It, it's it, it's a bit hard for us to uh, to consider these things. But but you know we are aware aware of this. So if I understood correctly, in all all your calculations, you take the probability for one side to being blocked and you multiply it by the volume of the section, more or less. But no, it, it it's not the probability for a site to be unblocked. It's the probability. That from that site you can generate right. uh, a, a, a cooperative a, 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 a relaxation process that would cause the entire system to be unlocked. Right, but then it's you multiply it by the volume right. of the region, and that pretty much assumes independence between this property for neighboring positions. Okay, so uh, okay, so so. so all of these models are constructed in a way such that the dynamics obey detailed balance with respect to a trivial Hamiltonian. Namely, we know that the equilibrium distribution is a, 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 is a uniform distribution over all the possible configurations of the particles in the system. Therefore, by construction, these models do not have any static correlations. So, the cor the, so the, the, there's zero correlation between the probability that that site can do something and probability that the neighboring site can do something by, by, by construction. Okay, and, and, and this is an important thing because, again, the, there's a big debate in the glass community on, on whether there are any static correlations or not. And in all these models, we, we, we assume by construction that there are no uh, correlations. Okay. You know, talking about Germany, I guess it's also important to consider external driving forces which drive your system. And actually, you stressed this in your introduction. Do you include this effect? Can be you include them within this? Kinetic constraint models. Yes, so so we we have some work already published on uh, incorporating driving forces into such kinetically constrained models in order to relate it to all these movies and pictures I showed you at the beginning. And actually, and and we also you know we're working on it. There are ways to incorporate that, and and we managed to demonstrate that that you can have something which is similar to the jamming transition as a function of of driving strengths. Um, but yes.